Um, so garden one is the is the valgus impracted fracture. So it's you know that um, superior cortex is is kind of found its way um, in it's it's impacted, <laughs> um, and so you're going to see that the medial cortex may not even have may not even have involvement. Although um, I think it doesn't always end that way, but these are those sort of maybe another way to think of it is garden one is kind of like the the um, buckle fracture of the of the hip is kind of the way I like to think about it a little bit. Um, once you see your fracture line go all the way through, um, but maybe it, it doesn't really seem displaced. Those trabecular lines um, are are collinear and they're you, they seem to go in their normal pattern from inferior to superior. Um, these are fractures that you are trying starting to think. Um, well, we can probably fix this, um, and it may not require much work um, to do. Once you get to garden three, it's somewhat displaced, um, and so this is where I th I think your point with the um, with the lateral view is really important, and we have to kind of extrapolate the garden classification a little bit into looking at that lateral view and saying, well, how displaced is it actually? Um, if you take the, the uh, AP and the lateral views. And I, I think a lot of times what you find when you look at both views is this isn't a garden three, um, this is a garden four. Um, so garden threes are a little bit unicorn fracture patterns in, in my opinion, or I don't tend to, I tend to sort of skip past them a little and, and think about those threes more like completely displaced fractures, especially in really elderly patients, because um, I think the recovery is just easier on the arthroplasty side than it is on the fixation side. Um, but for, for completeness sake, once you start to see those trabecular lines get displaced and, and um, the femoral neck isn't, isn't lined up from along your along your Shinton's line or along those cortices, then you, we have displaced fracture. And then the four, those are completely displaced fractures and they're usually pretty, pretty easy to identify. Yeah, and I, I think it's good that you uh, mentioned looking on the two different views because you can get fooled. And I know for a fact that I've been fooled before and I've texted attendings a picture and I'd say, you know, it's not displaced. I think we can probably do a couple pins in it. And then I'll come back and like, did you look at this lateral? It's completely displaced. It needs a total hip. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, well, all right. Well, uh, maybe I need to sit back and look through these images a little bit more. So uh, just to just to reiterate the fact that you should look for it on the uh, AP and the lateral. Use all your films to help clue you in. Yeah. Um, and one more thing, you kind of mentioned a little bit about, about the subcapital versus basic cervical. What does that have to do? As far as you're saying with your subcapital, you may have to think that you may not be able to get as much fixation across a fracture, uh, across a fracture line. Is that some of the things in, in basic cervical? I, say, I heard you were saying you could kind of treat it like it's an extra capsular um, fracture. I know we'll talk about that here in a bit, but yeah. So you got when you're thinking about the the options that are available to you, if you're going to use um, if you're going to use partially threaded screws to uh, compress across a, fra a fracture, you got 16 and you got 32 millimeter threaded screws. Um, and so you really got to look at those subcapital fractures sometimes and say, if I use my 16 millimeter partially threaded screw, is that going to, are those threads going to be fully across my fracture line? Or do I not have enough bone purchase to put screws in? Um, and so sometimes that might drive me to think about a different way to treat those subcapital fractures. If I don't think my, my partially or my screw threads are going to go completely across, um, completely across the fracture. And I don't, I don't think that all of your screws have to be partially threaded screws. Um, and maybe none of them do. Uh, but if you want good compression, I probably at least one of them has to be that way. And if you don't think you have enough purchase in the head for your screws, 
uh, then you might not want to think about fixation. You might want to start thinking about arthroplasty instead. Uh, um, okay. And then the basal cervical fractures. I, those are in my mind. Those are intertrope fractures. Um, and so uh, they're really hard intertrope fractures. Um, but I, those are. I'm going to think about nailing or. Um, a sliding hip screw type construct with basic cervical fractures instead of instead of screws or uh, most of the time arthroplasty. Okay, and and we touched base on the pile of classification. You know, you're talking about it has to do with the orientation of the fracture line. If it's you know up to 30 degrees, it's type one. 30 to 50 is a type two and greater than 50 is a type three. And we always hear about the greater, uh, the more vertical, the fracture line, the, the more unstable, uh, you know, the more unstable that the fracture is. Is there any, any, anything else you could add regarding that Powell's classification? Um, no, I, I mean, I think that's it. The, the only other thing that I think should be, um, should be thought about, and this may not be appropriate for this, um, for this talk, but those type threes, they're really hard to see. So, you know, anytime you go to a trauma meeting or if you see a high energy femoral shaft fracture, you know, we're all wringing our hands and spending all this time talking about the, um, talking about the unidentified femoral neck fracture. And part of the reason that, that they're so hard to see is because they're usually these higher PALS angle fractures and it's really hard to get an x-ray beam to see that fracture line. So we really have to have a high level of suspicion when we have you know, high energy femoral shaft fractures and we're, we're trying to not be the person who missed the ipsilateral femoral neck fracture. Yep, and I seem like in my, like you say, in high energy, so it's something that this, classification seems to come into play a whole lot more with the younger uh, the younger population when they come in with these uh, femoral neck injuries. So I'm glad that we did mention it. Another, I think it's another high yield, uh, another high yield, uh, you know, topic. And like you say, you probably can talk a whole lot more, uh, especially with like the type three on different ways to treat them and different things like that, or if you get a non-union and things like that. So, but 